Avinu Malkenu, our Father, our King, we just thank you so much that you love us so much. And I just pray, Lord, that as you try to uh, teach us your language, Father, that we would have ears to hear uh, the importance of uh, knowing Hebrew from its context, uh, every letter being a picture, every letter being a number, uh, every letter being a word. Father, that <clears throat> you would implant in us a desire to even go deeper. We just thank you. And also, Father, we just pray for the people in Japan. Father, it's just horrible what's happened over there. We have a lot of people in Japan who come to our website. And Father, we just uh, want to speak to them and let them know that there are people here that do care. We are concerned and we just ask for your spirit to give them the peace and uh, all of the help that they need. And we lift up the people in Itamar. Father, we ask that you would bless them and give them your peace in Yeshua's name. Amen. God likes to party. And he's given us all these feasts uh, so we can kind of understand this. And so what we're going to start with is the Feast of Trumpets. Uh, the last time we were going over the spring feast. So now we're going to go over the fall feast. What a, a lot of people don't understand, again, you only see this in the Hebrew, in Leviticus 23, uh, when God talks about the feasts. Now when we hear feast, we think of the word food. But the word again means divine appointment. Did you know that? The same word in Genesis 1 that's translated seasons is translated as feasts in Leviticus 23. Same Hebrew word, but different English words. There's, there's not consistency in English, so you miss some of the most important things. And so you'll notice in Leviticus 23, 4, it says, Speak to the children of Israel, saying, In the seventh month, in the first day of the month, you shall have a Sabbath, a memorial, a blowing of trumpets, a holy convocation. Now, the word convocation in Hebrew is mikra. And it implies not only an assembly, everyone coming together, but a dress rehearsal. Okay, so let's put up the first clip. <clears throat> so it's a dress rehearsal. So think about this. You go through the dress rehearsal so you know what to do when the event comes. So what God did, he said, okay, I'm going to give Israel these divine appointments so they can go through the dress rehearsal so that they will understand when the time comes. That's why they slew the Passover lamb every year on Passover, because 1,500 years later, Messiah was going to what? Die on Passover. He was buried in the ground on the Feast of Unleavened Bread. He rose on the Jewish Feast of First Fruits. And then Pentecost, a lot of people don't know, the Jews have been keeping Pentecost for 1,500 years before Pentecost. They were commanded to in Deuteronomy 16, 16. They call it the Feast of Shavuot. Okay? And so here are the Jews were the first Pentecostals. And the Jews to this day keep Pentecost, and Pentecostals don't. Go figure. But they, here you have, for 1,500 years, the Jews are keeping the Feast of Shavuot, which is why all the Jews were there in Acts at Pentecost. Jews from every nation were there because they had to be there. And if you remember, Peter said, these guys aren't drunk. It's the third hour of the day. That's nine in the morning. That's the time of the morning sacrifice. So here... All the spring feasts were dress rehearsals for what was going to happen 1,500 years later. Well, guess what? The fall feasts are the dress rehearsals for what's going to happen in our lifetime. So the Christians need to understand the fall feasts by, by separating themselves from Judaism or from Ju the Hebrew roots understanding. They don't, a lot of people teach revelation, but they don't understand. God said, I declared the end from the beginning. So therefore, if you want to know the end, you've got to study the beginning, which is all in the Torah. And he gave the fall feast as the dress rehearsals for what will, what's coming. And guess what? They will happen on those very days. We don't set dates. We have no idea what year. But believe me, if he is the same yesterday, today, and forever, if he died on Passover, and he was buried on unleavened bread, and he rose on first fruits, and the Holy Spirit was poured out on Shavuot, doesn't it make sense the fall feast will happen on those days as well? Now, they didn't know what year it was going to happen, but they still went through the rehearsals. This is why every year we do all the feasts. We go through the rehearsal of the Feast of Trumpets. So let's take a look at the Feast of Trumpets, and you're going to see why. Basically, when they're blowing the shofar, and I have in Hebrew the word teruah, which is the word for blowing, and it's to be a dress rehearsal, a holy dress rehearsal. So God is blowing the shofar saying to everybody, you better get ready. Look at Numbers 29.1. In the seventh month, the first day of the month, you shall have a holy convocation. Do no servile work. It's a day of teruah, blowing the trumpets to you. Okay, so again, we see it was a Sabbath. But 
so you can have Sabbath on a Monday, a Tuesday, a Wednesday, or Thursday, or Friday as their calendar rotates. Now look at Numbers 10.5. It says, when you blow an alarm. You know, again, this is the word teruah. Then the camps that lie on the east parts are going to go forward. So the word teruah speaks of an alarm. Think of an alarm clock. What does an alarm clock do? It wakes you up. The point of the Feast of Trumpets is to wake up. And the church needs to do what? Wake up. What a better time to wake up than on the day of waking up. Okay, now look at Numbers 23, 21. This is fascinating. Here it says concerning uh, God, he says, He has not beheld iniquity in Jacob, neither has he seen perverseness in Israel. The Lord his God is with him, and the shout of a king is among them. Do you know the Hebrew word for shout here is teruah? So again, the same word that is translated shout is also translated alarm, is also translated as blowing. Well, look at Psalm 47, 5. God is gone up with a shout, the Lord with the sound of the shofar. So here we, again, we have the word teruah and the word shofar. And you have the blowing of the shofar, okay? God has gone up with a shout. Well, now let's look at Zephaniah 1, 14 and 16. Here it says, the great day of the Lord is near. It is near. It hasteth greatly. Even the voice of the day of the Lord. Now, when he's talking about the great day of the Lord, the day of the Lord, what is he talking about? He's talking about the tribulation. Okay? Now, this is important to understand this. He says, the mighty man will cry bitterly. That day is a day of wrath, it's a day of trouble and distress, a day of wasteness and desolation, a day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness. It's a day of the trumpet and alarm against the fenced cities and against the high towers. You know the word for day is yom, and here the word for trumpet is shofar, and the word for alarm is teruah. So here he's telling you the tribulation will be taking place and begin on Yom Teruah, which is what Rosh Hashanah is known as, the Feast of Trumpets. So this here is telling you this this day of the Lord, this tribulation, will begin some year on the Feast of Trumpets. So if you don't know when the Feast of Trumpets is, how are you going to know if it even begins? So this is why we need to understand this. Now, here's an often misunderstanding. Let's look at this next clip with the sky. Okay, this is like the to imply like this day of darkness and gloominess is coming. Well, I want to bring out two things. First off, it says in Revelation 1.10, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. Everyone misinterprets that. That does not refer to Sunday. It doesn't even refer to Saturday. It refers to the day of the Lord. He says, I was in on the Spirit on the Lord's day. Would have been better translated, I was in the Spirit on the day of the Lord. In other words, the whole revelation is about the tribulation and all this, and that's what he's talking about. He's not talking about Saturday or Sunday. The Lord's day is another way of saying the day of the Lord. That's what he's referring to here. And what does he hear? A great voice as of a what? Okay, remember on Mount Sinai, there's the sound of the shofar and the voices. So here we see it's the voices of a trumpet. Can you imagine? Here's this trumpet. And this voice of God just speaking, coming out, announcing. Don't you want to know the sound of that? Wouldn't you want to know the sound of that voice and the sound of the shofar like they heard in Exodus? Well, look at this. In Revelation 3.20, he says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock, and if any man hear my what? Voice and open the door, I'll come to him and sup with him and he with me. A lot of people misinterpret that verse. They look at that verse thinking, you know, this is a salvational verse. Jesus is standing at the door of the unsaved person, knocking out the door. Won't you let him in? No. He's speaking to the church of Laodicea. He says, I'm outside the church knocking, saying, hello, guys. And they go, leave me alone. We're having church. They don't even know God's outside. He's not even inside. And he said, I want you to come out here and sup with me and be with me. But this voice he wants you to get to know is that voice of the shofar. Look at Psalms 89, 15. You'll understand why. Here it says, Blessed is the people that know the joyful sound. Do you know what the word for sound there is? Teruah. Blessed are the people that know the sound of the shofar. Because when the dead in Christ do rise at the sound of the shofar, okay, it's good to know that sound. It says, 
they shall walk, O Lord, in the light of your countenance. That means in your face. They're, they're going to they're, they're see you face to face. <clears throat> and then look at Isaiah 58, 1. The Lord says, cry aloud, spare not, lift up your voice like what? Like a shofar. Okay? He wants us to be like him. His voice is like a shofar. Now let's take a look at some of the first uses of the shofar in light of the Feast of Trumpets. In Exodus 19, 19, we see the very first time you see the use of this word shofar is in the giving of the Torah, or the first Pentecost, or the Shavuot. It says, and when the voice of the trumpet sounded long and waxed louder and louder, Moses spoke and God answered him by a voice. It's also used to proclaim the year of Jubilee on Yom Kippur. We see in Leviticus 25, 9, you're to cause the trumpet of the Jubilee to sound on the 10th day of the seventh month in the day of atonement. So you make the trumpet sound throughout all your land. We also see the trumpets were used to conquer Jericho. We see this in Joshua chapter 6 and verse 4 and 5. Here it talks about, I think it's interesting. How many of you heard about seven angels in the book of Revelation? And seven trumpets? And here in Joshua 6, 4, and 5, we have seven priests. They're bearing before the ark seven trumpets of ram's horns. And the seventh day, you're to compass the city seven times. And the priests blow with the trumpets, and it'll come to pass when they make a long blast with the ram's horn. And when you hear the sound of the shofar, all the people do what? Shout with a great shout, and the wall of the city will fall down flat. And then the people will stand up every man straight before him. We also see the trumpets are used for assembling the battle. <clears throat> we see in Judges 3, 27 through 30. It came to pass when he was come that he blew a shofar in the mountain of Ephraim. The children of Israel went down from him from the mount and before them. And he said unto them, follow after me, for the Lord has delivered your enemies, the Moabites, into your hands. So they went down after him. They took the fords of Jordan toward Moab. And he suffered not a man to pass over. And then it says they slew of Moab at that time about 10,000 men, all lusty men of valor. There escaped not a man. So Moab was subdued that day in the land of Israel, and the land had rest for 80 years. So here we see the shofar is used to assemble for battle. We also see the shofar is used to coronate the king in 1 Kings 1, 33 and 34. It says, the king also said to them, take with you the servants of your Lord, cause Solomon, my son, to ride upon my own mule and bring him down to Gihon. Let Zadok the priest and Nathan the prophet anoint him there, king over Israel. And what are they supposed to do? Blow the shofar and say, God save King Solomon. And so we see that I believe when Yeshua is crowned as king of kings and lord of lords when his return, that's why they're going to be blowing the shofar. You know, doo -doo -doo, here comes the king. And uh, then we also see it's used to warn of impending danger. In Amos chapter 3, verse 6, it says, Shall a shofar be blown in the city and the people not be afraid? Shall there be evil in the city and the Lord has not done it? Okay, so it's, to, it's always to warn of impending danger. And in uh, every year, it's used to let you know that what's coming in 10 days later, Yom Kippur. The day of judgment. So it's, it's this, this warning of impending danger. You better get right with God. You've got 10 days to get right. Look at Ezekiel 33, 5. <clears throat> it says, He heard the sound of the shofar, and he did not take warning. His blood will be upon him, but he that takes warning will deliver his soul. This is why it's good to know the sound of the shofar. But let's look at some of the other uses of the shofar. Do you realize it's going to be used for the final in-gathering Remember the whole concept was to have a holy convocation, which means everyone come together? Well, look at Isaiah 27, 13. It'll come to pass in that day that the great trumpet will be blown, and they shall come which are ready to perish in the land of Assyria, the outcast in the land of Egypt, and they'll worship the Lord in the holy mount at Jerusalem. So here we see a shofar is used to gather the elect from the four corners of the earth. Look at Matthew 24, 30 and 31. It says, then it shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And then all the tribes of the earth will mourn. And they'll see the Son of, Man, Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send his angels with a what? Great sound of a trumpet. And they'll gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. So the use of the shofar is to gather the elect. And then look at Zechariah 9.14. It's also going to be used at the very final battle. 
It says, and the Lord will be seen over them, and his arrow, sh arrow shall go forth as the lightning, and the Lord God is going to do what? He's going to blow the shofar. So here we see the Lord God is going to blow the shofar, and he'll go with the whirlwinds of the south. We also see the shofars are used at the resurrection of the dead. Remember the word shout means teruah? And the day for the Feast of Trumpets is known as Yom Teruah, the day of shouting, the day of blowing the shofars. And look what it says. The Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a teruah, with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the shofar of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. So I'm telling you, now I, I don't get into the rapture when the rapture is going to take place. If it's in the beginning, if it's in the middle, if it's at the end. I don't care, really. I really don't. I, I believe we're about to enter the Super Bowl of human history, and don't take me out of the game, coach. Leave me here. Put me in. Okay, that's my attitude. But... I do believe that the resurrection of the dead will take place on the Feast of Trumpets some year. That's why it's really good to know when the Feast of Trumpets is every year. Okay, and to go through the dress rehearsals. All right, because I, I really believe that. I think the Bible is plain when you understand the Hebrew text. That the, and even the Jews believe that. To this day, they've always believed that. That the res resurrection of the dead takes place on trumpets. You see it in Daniel 11 or Daniel 12. But anyway, I have DVDs on all the feasts uh, available if you want to get more detailed information on this stuff. But think about this for a minute. Yom Teruah speaks of the coming of the Messiah. It speaks of his coronation as King of Kings and Lord of Lords over the whole world. It speaks of his coming to the defense of his brethren, the Jewish people. It speaks of his regathering of Israel's exiles for the year of Jubilee and the resurrection of the dead. Now, what a better way to annually celebrate this day than to gather together as a rehearsal, to worship Yeshua, to discuss his coming, hear a teaching on the blast of the shofar, and then to hear the shofar blown 100 times. That's what the, every year on the Feast of Trumpets, they blow the shofar 100 times. And do you know what the 100th blast is known as? The last trump. When Paul says the phrase, the last trump, that's a Hebrew idiom for the Feast of Trumpets. He's telling you again it's going to take place on the Feast of Trumpets. The last trump is the 100th blast. Now, how many of you have been to our Feast of Trumpets service where we blow the shofar and you hear the 100 blasts? Isn't that incredible? So we'll be doing that again right here uh, sometime at the end of September this year. Now, does that sound like, well, that's nothing to get too excited about. That's legalism doing this. <laughs> Worshiping Yeshua, talking about his second coming. Can you imagine what it's going to be like? I mean, think about this. I want you guys to really grasp for this. Every year on the Feast of Trumpets, we gather together to do the dress rehearsal when everyone gathers together. We all shout for Yeshua to come back. Okay? And, and we're blowing the shofars as if this is the coronation of the king. Can you imagine some year when we're doing that, all of a sudden you're translated and you're among the angelic host and you're doing it at the same time? That is what's going to happen. That's why you want to be here. On the Feast of Trumpets, some year, we don't know when, we're just going to be shouting and singing and the next thing we know, we're going to have this huge angelic host all around us. That's why you want to be at the dress rehearsal? That's legalism. <laughs> You're nuts. <laughs> the other thing about the Feast of Trumpets, it's known as, okay, the hidden day. It's known as the hidden day. It's also known as the wedding of the Messiah. Okay, you might be familiar with the, the, the Jewish wedding. Uh, I don't have the verse here for you. Again, it's on the DVDs. But he says, as, a, as the groom marries a bride, so will I marry you. Okay, so that means the pattern is after the Jewish wedding. So if you know the Jewish wedding, you understand the wedding taking place in the book of Revelation. But they have what's called the Hakidashin Nesuin, which is the betrothal and then the final marriage ceremony. You remember Joseph and Mary. They were betrothed, but they weren't married yet, but they were legally married. You following me? I believe Shabbat or Pentecost was the betrothal and the Feast of Trumpets is the actual marriage ceremony. So he, he was married to Israel, but only the betrothal had taken place, the engagement. 
Okay, that, that is what Pentecost, there's a lot of people out there that believe the rapture or whatever is going to happen on Pentecost some year. They don't understand. Pentecost was the engagement. The Feast of Trumpets is the wedding. And that's what the Jews have always believed. That's when the wedding of the Messiah is going to take place. Okay, so how many of you want to be at the wedding? Don't you think it'd be good to be at the rehearsal? Okay, that's what the Feast of Trumpets is every year. It's the dress rehearsal. Okay. It's also known as the opening of the books. Okay, every year on the Feast of Trumpets, God opens the books, and he decides... Again, you'll see this on the DVDs. I can back everything up with Scripture. But here, like the opening of the books, he decides who's going to live, who's going to die. Ten days later, Yom Kippur is known as the closing of the books, and now judgment is meted out the following year. Okay? And when you read... I don't know if I have this in here, but I'll just quote it to you. I think it's in here. Oh, yeah, it's coming up. Okay. We'll get to it in a second. Um... It's also known as the Day of the Awakening Blast. In Judaism, the Feast of Trumpets is known as the Day of the Awakening Blast. That's the resurrection of the dead. Okay, so when you understand your Hebrew roots, you begin to understand, boy, there's a lot of events that are going to be happening on the Feast of Trumpets. Okay, let's go to the next event. I can only barely touch on the Feast of Trumpets, but uh, we have more information on that. But now we're going to jump to Yom Kippur a little bit and take a look at that. Yom Kippur is known as the closing of the books. And what do we find in Leviticus 23, 27, and 28? It says, on the 10th day of this seventh month, there'll be a day of atonement. It'll be a holy convocation. So again, it's a holy assembly. It's a holy dress rehearsal for you. And he says, you're to afflict your souls. You're to offer an offering made by fire to the Lord. You're to do no work in that same day, for it's a day of atonement, to make atonement for you before the Lord your God. Now let's look at verse 32. It says, And it shall be unto you a Sabbath of rest, and you're to afflict your souls the ninth day of the month at even, even from even to even, you shall celebrate your Sabbath. Wow, what I'm, how do I celebrate afflicting myself? Okay, but you, you have to understand what's going on here. First off, it, again, this is the tenth day of the seventh month. So even if it falls on a Tuesday or Wednesday, it's considered a Sabbath. The Day of Atonement is considered the Sabbath of all Sabbaths. But look at Leviticus 16.33. A lot of people don't understand Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, at all. Here it says, He shall make an atonement for the holy sanctuary. He shall make atonement for the tabernacle. Well, what did the tabernacle do wrong? What did the sanctuary do wrong? It says, uh, He is also to make atonement for the altar. Or did the altar sin? What's going on here? He shall later make an atonement, and he shall make, also make an atonement for the priests and for all the people of the congregation. But what's interesting, there was all these sacrifices that were done throughout the year, and so you have all this blood everywhere, and they have to atone for all that blood by putting more blood on it. It's not like they had to use water and scrub it down. That's not how they make it clean, any more than you can take water and scrub your sins away. In Leviticus 16, 5 through 9, it says, And he shall take of the congregation of the children of Israel two kids of the goats for a sin offering. Now, I want you to notice this. This is very important. It does not say two kids of the goats for two different offerings. The two kids of the goats are what? One offering. That's important. Because some people, as, well, let's read it. It says, uh, it's to make atonement for, well, let's go on. It says, uh, and a one ram for a burnt offering. And Aaron shall offer his burlock, bullock of the sin offering, which is for who? Okay, and then he makes atonement for himself and for his house. He takes the two goats and presents them before the Lord at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. Aaron casts lots upon the two goats, one lots for the Lord, the other lots for the scapegoat. And Aaron brings the goat upon which the Lord's lot fell and offered him for a sin offering. Okay, so you have two goats. One goat is offered up as a sin offering. The other goat, the Azazel or scapegoat, is taken out into the wilderness. But they're considered one offering. The reason why I say that is some people think the Azazel goat represents Satan. Well, that's absurd because Satan can't make atonement for you. And it's one offering. It's not two offerings. Okay? So I wanted to bring that up. But what it represents is Yeshua, I believe, who died for your sins. But not only that, he took your sins away. And look at the difference here. First off, we see in John 1:29. The next day, John saw Jesus coming to him. And he said, Behold the Lamb of God, which does what? 
takes away the sins of the world. So he's the scapegoat. So he is the Azazel. That's what this is telling you. So from Yom Teruah to Yom Kippur, it's time to be contemplating seeking the Lord, seeking repentance, understanding substitutional atonement, and applying these truths to our lives. Now in Psalms 103.12, it says, As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. Do you know why it says from the east to the west and not the north to the south? Because if he said north to the south, your sins come right back again. But if he says east to west, they never go back. They, never, they only go one direction. They never meet up. As a matter of fact, in Micah 7.19, it says... He will turn again, he'll have compassion on us, he'll subdue our iniquities, he will cast all their sins into the depths of the sea. In other words, they're not only removed, but forgotten. How often do we sometimes, we sin against somebody and we think they're never going to forget? Okay, but God says, look, I've not only forgiven you, I've forgotten about it, so why do you keep bringing it up? Um... Uh, Let's look at Acts 27.9. Yom Kippur was known as the fast. That's the one fast day. That, of all fast days, that's when they fast. And when you understand that, and you read Acts 27.9, where it says, Now when much time was spent, when sailing was now dangerous, because the fast was now already passed, Paul admonished them. Well, he's referring to Yom Kippur here. So you know the time of year. You know this is probably in October, in the fall. So you can, when you understand your Hebrew roots, you begin to date different things that are going on here. Now, do you remember what happened on the first Yom Kippur after the Exodus? The first Passover, what happens? They leave Egypt. The first Pentecost, Moses is up there, and they sin with the golden calf. Okay, do you remember what happened on the first Day of Atonement? Okay, they sin with the golden calf. Moses goes back up for another 40 days, seeking repentance, you know, see, you know doing something, as a matter of fact, let's look at Exodus 32, 30 and 33. You'll see the first Yom Kippur. Remember, it's the opening of the books on the Feast of Trumpets, the closing of the book on Yom Kippur. And in Exodus 32, 30 through 33, it says, It came to pass on the morrow that Moses said to the people, You've sinned a great sin. And now I will go to the Lord for adventure. I shall make atonement for you, for your sin. So Moses returned to the Lord and said, Oh, this people have sinned a great sin. They made them gods of gold, yet now if you will forgive their sin, and you have this hyphen there, it's the only place in your whole Bible, and it, it's like a great pause where Moses is thinking, this sin is so great, there's no way you can forgive their sin. So what does he do? He says, if not, blot me, I pray thee, out of your book which you have written. So he wasn't talking about the book of life, eternal salvation. He was saying, let me die today. Let me die. It was a physical life that he was talking about. Blot me out of the book. Kill me, he says. I'm going to make it to him. I want you to kill me so you don't have to kill. Because God was ready to kill Aaron, it says. He was ready to kill all the rest of them. And he said, I'm going to make of you a great nation. Forget it. We're going to start over. So when he's saying that, he's talking about, don't kill all of them. Kill me. Now, that's incredible when you think about it. Here you got these bunch of rebellious people that make the golden calf. I mean, how many of us would die for a righteous person, let alone an unrighteous person? But this was Moses' attitude here. And so what does he do? He comes down after 40 days, and he's, he's been learning how to build the tabernacle from God, and he comes down on the Day of Atonement, announcing atonement's been made. You're forgiven. So the first Day of Atonement is Moses' descent from the mountain, letting them know they've all been forgiven, atonement's been made. And so what do they do then? They spend the next five days gathering material to build the tabernacle, and five days later begins the Feast of Tabernacles. So again, this is, and, and what are we preparing for? We're preparing for God to tabernacle among us for the thousand-year reign. So the spring feasts were his first coming, the fall feasts are his second coming. I believe some year on the Feast of Trumpets, the tribulation will begin. Some year after the tribulations began on Yom Kippur, See, what's the difference between Passover and Yom Kippur? They both seem to have blood and atonement. What's, what, what's the difference? Here's the difference. The fall feasts are for the nations. Okay, the, the Passover is just general. Whosoever will. But now, God is going to judge the nations. Yom Kippur, if you'll notice, the goat was for Aaron. It was for his Levites. It was for Israel. So some year on Yom Kippur, Israel as a nation will have the blinders removed and they will see that Yeshua is their Messiah. But that will happen after the tribulation has begun. 
And then what happens? You have the Feast of Tabernacles where Yeshua returns, the Messiah, and he tabernacles among men for the thousand-year reign. And it will begin on the Feast of Tabernacles. Okay, you see that in Zechariah 14. So all these things are rehearsals. And you're going to see this. Look at this. Uh, One thing that we find is this is the day that the nation of Israel was to be atoned for. And if you remember, on the Feast of Tabernacles, Israel kills 70 bulls is what they did. Why? Because there were 70 nations. God said to Israel, I want you to be a priest. I want, to, I want the whole world to be saved. So I want you to be a priest. Just like Aaron had to do a sacrifice for himself and then for his sons and then for the nation. Why? Because five days later, they were to kill 70 bulls, one for each nation, to make atonement for the nations. And so what does the devil do? He convinces the nations to go and destroy the temple, the very thing God was using to make atonement for them. Isn't he pretty smart? Okay? So here God said, look, Israel, make atonement for yourself this day, and then five days later, as priests, sanctified, I want you to make atonement for all the nations. I want you to kill 70 bulls, one bull for each nation. But watch how you see the book of Leviticus, the Yom Kippur service, in the book of Revelation. How many of you heard of the word trumpet in Revelation? What do you think that pertains to? The Feast of Trumpets. Now you're going to see Yom Kippur in the book of Revelation. Let's, uh, first off, can you imagine, uh, on Yom Kippur, the high priest would have to take off his royal garments and he have to put on a totally white linen cloth. That's all he could have on, or a white linen garment, which speaks of righteousness. But can you imagine having on a white linen garment and you're slaughtering sacrifices? You're going to get blood all over your white linen garment. That's why they only used them once. Every year, they'd have new garments. But look at Leviticus 16, 3 through 5. Aaron comes into the holy place with a young bullock for a sin offering and a ram for a burnt offering. And then look at, look at all the white linen garments he puts on. He puts on the holy linen coat and then the, the white linen breeches on his flesh. And then he's girded with a linen girdle and he has a linen miter on his head. And he, then he washes his flesh in water uh, so he can put them on. And then he takes of the congregation of the children of Israel these two kids of the goats for a sin offering and one ram for a burnt offering. So he's about to do all this slaughtering with these white linen garments on. Well, let's look at Isaiah 63, which talks about the coming of the Messiah, verse 1 through 4. Who is this that's coming from Edom with dyed garments from Botsra? This that is glorious in his apparel, traveling in the greatness of his strength. I that speak in righteousness, mighty to save. Wherefore are you red in your apparel? Your garments like him that treads the wine fat. I've trodden the winepress alone, and of the people there was none with me. I will tread them in my anger and trample them in my fury, and their blood will be sprinkled on my garments." I will stay in all my raiment, for the day of vengeance is in my heart, the year my redeemed has come. This is the year of Jubilee. Yom Kippur. Look at Revelation 19, verse 2 and 13 through 15. It talks about how he avenged the blood of his servants at her hand. He was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood. You go down, it says, The armies which were in heaven followed upon white horses, clothed in what? Fine linen, white and clean. Do you know every Yom Kippur, all the Jews wear white when they come to the service? Okay, this event that you're reading here in Revelation is a Yom Kippur event. Everyone's going to be dressed in white on Yom Kippur when they're coming back. Because it will happen on that day. And I don't have time to go into it, but in Leviticus, you can see how no man could enter the temple on the feast of Yom Kippur. And in Revelation, you see no one can enter the temple. I mean, there's all these parallels that I go into on those DVDs. But let's go now to Sukkot. So we got like six minutes to do Sukkot. Now, another name for Sukkot is the Feast of Tabernacles because they dwelt in booths. Another name is the Feast of Nations because that's when all the nations were to be atoned for. And I don't have time to go in all of it. But how many of you have ever heard of Gog and Magog? Do you know what Gog means in Hebrew? It means a roof, like the roof of your house. The Gog-Magog war will take place during the Feast of Tabernacles. The Jews have always believed that as well. And what it is, it's the battle of the man-made roof versus the weak, humble sukkah that is just unstable with little branches thrown on it where you can see through the stars and you're trusting in God. You're not trusting in what you build. It's an amazing concept. But what Sukkot is all about is how God keeps his promises. We see in Leviticus 23, verse 39 through 43, now on the 15th day of the seventh month, when you've gathered in the fruit. Okay, think, gathered in the fruit, gathers his elect, 
It's a feast of harvest. Okay, this talks about the final end gathering. And uh, the very last sentence of that long paragraph, well, in the middle, I have it underlined. Here, it says, I'll just read it. It's God's word, and it is good. When you've gathered in the fruit of the land, you're to keep a feast or a divine appointment to the Lord seven days. The first day is a Sabbath, and the eighth day is a Sabbath. You can have three Sabbaths in one week. You can have a Sabbath in the middle of the week, the Sabbath on Saturday, and then the Sabbath at the middle of the next week as the first day and the eighth day. And it says, uh, you shall take for yourself on the first day the boughs of goodly trees, branches of palm trees, the boughs of thick trees, and the willows of the brook, and you what? Shall rejoice. Now, the word shall. Now, I was in a courthouse one time, uh, not for anything I've done wrong, but um, the, I heard the judge telling this one kid that the ordinance says, you shall. Now, you shall means there's no if, ends, or buts, you shall. And here God is saying you shall rejoice. In other words, for a whole week, I don't want any whiny whinies. You have to be happy for a whole week. Okay, why? Because the Lord God is going to be among you. And then he says, um, you shall keep a feast to the Lord seven days in the year. Remember, the whole idea of a day with the Lord is, is a thousand years. It's the whole week of God and creation. This is the week when we rejoice it's the whole concept of him dwelling among us back in the Garden of Eden. And it says uh, it'll be a statute uh, for 2,000 years. Oh, no. It'll be a statute forever in your generations. You shall celebrate it in the seventh month. He says there to dwell in booths for seven days. The whole concept of a booth is a temporary dwelling place. In other words, this body is not our home. Aren't you glad this body isn't your home? It's just a temporary dwelling place. That's the concept of the Feast of Tabernacles, to realize this earth is not our home. This body is not our home. And he says, you're to dwell in booths seven days. All that are Israelite born will dwell in booths, that your generations may know that uh, I made the children of Israel to dwell in booths when I brought them out of the land of Egypt. I'm the Lord your God. So the booths uh, is a temporary shelter. It's a reminder of God's protection versus Gog. It's known as the Feast of Ingathering and the time of rejoicing. So what do we see here? Passover begins the story of redemption. And Sukkot concludes the story with the fulfillment of God's promises to come in and to the promised land. So it's the beginning and the end of the story. Zechariah 14, 16 through 19. You're going to see why this takes place during the Feast of Tabernacles. Here it says, it'll come to pass, everyone that's left of all the nations, okay, after God's judgment on Yom Kippur, when all the, the battle of Armageddon takes place, basically it's done, it's over. And then on the Feast of Tabernacles, look what it says. Those that are left of all the nations that came against Jerusalem shall go up from year to year to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, and they have to do what? Keep the Feast of Tabernacles. And it'll be that whoever doesn't come up of all the families of the earth to Jerusalem to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, even upon them shall be what? Guess what they do during the Feast of Tabernacles? They pray for rain because it's, the land is crying out for thirst because it's the whole dry summer in Israel. Everything is crying out for rain. So the land is crying out and everyone's crying out for rain. And God says, okay, you want rain? You better come to the Feast of Tabernacles and pray for it. And if the family of Egypt doesn't go up and they don't come, they're going to have no rain. But they also get the plague. Wherewith the Lord will smite all the heathen that come not up to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. Do you realize there will be heathen during the millennial rain? People think there's just going to be Christians or believers. There's going to be a whole bunch of sinners that are going to die and everything else. But here are the heathen that don't come up. It says not to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. This is the punishment of Egypt and the punishment of all nations that don't come up to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. Now, is God the same today, yesterday, today, and forever? Okay, if he said, let's keep the Feast of Tabernacles back then, we're going to keep it during millennial reign, oh, let's just forget it in the middle. That doesn't make sense, does it? So, we'll close with this. i got three minutes. Okay, John 7, 37 and 38. This is going to make so much more sense when you understand what was going on in the temple during the Feast of Tabernacles. Here it is, John 7. In the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and he cried out, saying, If any man thirst... Remember I was telling you how the land is crying out? We're earthen vessels. We're the land. We're crying out to be thirsty. He says, Let him come to me and drink. He that believes on me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly will flow rivers of living water. What verse is he referring to? He's referring to Isaiah 12. Remember when Miriam crossed the Red Sea... The horse and rider thrown into the sea. God is, you know, my strength and my salvation. That's quoted in Exodus 15. It's quoted in Isaiah, I mean in Psalms 118. 
And then it's quoted in Isaiah 12. Do you know the Jews every year sing this song? This is the song that Jesus interrupted when they were singing. In the temple, this is the very song they were singing when he stood up and he cried out. And look at what they were singing. This is the words to the song. Behold, God is my Yeshua. Hebrew word for salvation. I will trust and not be afraid, for the Lord Jehovah is my strength and my song. He also has become my Yeshua. Therefore, with joy shall you draw water out of the wells of Yeshua. This is what they're thinking when he says, yes, as the scripture says. And in that day shall you say, praise the Lord, call upon his name, declare his doings among the people, make mention that his name is exalted, sing unto the Lord, for he has done excellent things, this is known in all the earth. Now what did he do? It says he cried out, right? Look what this next verse says. Cry out and shout, you inhabitant of Zion, for great is the Holy One who's in your midst. So here in John 7, this is what was, they were singing. All of a sudden they're going, oh my goodness, this is the Lord. He's in our midst. He's crying out. He's shouting. But if you don't know that this is what they were singing, when you read John 7, you don't make the connection. And there are so much more powerful things that were going on in the temple that's on the Feast DVDs. So we'll end with that. But anyway, so this is just to give you a taste of the fall feast, what's to come. How many of you want to know what's coming? Then go to the rehearsals. <laughs> then you can practice. All right? So next week, remember, it's party time. And then the next week is going to be so incredible. We're going to have David Rubin here. And he was the victim of a terrorist attack as well as his son, Ruby, when he was only a couple of years old, he was shot through the back of the neck, his son was, and he was shot in the leg, David was, while he's trying to drive, miraculously, the car started up again after it had stopped. You'll hear his testimony, and you'll hear uh, the latest about what's happening right here, right now. So let's, let's stand, and we'll close with prayer. <clears throat> Father, we just thank you so much for you're always warning us. You're always trying to tell your kids, here's what's coming, rehearse it, rehearse it. So, Father, I just pray each one of us would begin to understand the importance of the feasts, the appointed times. Father, that we'd, we would see that these are your divine appointments. It doesn't say these are the Jewish feasts. It doesn't say these are Israel's feasts. It says these are the feasts of the Lord. And if we belong to the Lord, these divine appointments belong to us. I pray, Lord, we can learn from them and we can learn from you. Just give everyone a safe trip home. In Yeshua's name, amen. Thank you. Thank you for studying with us today. If you have any questions regarding the material discussed, please contact me at my email address. It's Pastor Mark at El Shaddai Ministries. Be blessed and shalom.